your honors. My name is Pat McNally, and it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the appellant, Curtis Bradley. If I can have just a moment, you know, I'd like to reserve three minutes for my rebuttal. If I can have just a moment to get set up. Uh, I often bring water up here because either my allergies or nervousness gets me choked up often, <laughs> so uh, I might, s well, it's Counsel, can I just ask you one just general question on reviewing diversion cases? Yes, sir. And then, so obviously you, you, you're, you would like us to just say, hey, he's entitled to diversion. But you, you know as well as I do that we send most of these back because there's so many specific findings that the trial court needs to make. One of the, in preparing for this, one of the questions I thought of was, in this case in particular, the trial court made several credibility determinations. Um, which would probably go against your client. So can we really, and just not, you can talk about your case if you want. I'm yeah, really just kind of talking no, big yeah. picture here real quick. Can we really do a true de novo if there's a bunch of credibility determinations which would go, might go against diversion and then turn around and us grant diversions? Does my question make sense how I'm trying to ask that? I mean, since we don't do credibility, that's for the right. trial court. So I'm trying to, figure out in my head how we're supposed to do de novo when their credibility determinations have already been made mm -hmm. that we can't change. So how do, we, how do we juggle those two things, just in general, or your case, however you want to answer it? Yeah, and, and Judge, Judge Dyer, I'll tell you, I often melt when Your Honor asks questions, <laughs> hypotheticals that go beyond the jurisprudence <laughs> of criminal law because I don't practice in other areas like divorce or in one case we had before, contract law. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about the big picture on that. And it goes to some of the cases that talk about when this court can do a de novo review versus sent, remaining it back for consideration. And in general, I would say that if the credibility this court is not to, to, to make credibility or to reevaluate credibility questions unless there's just an absolute abuse of discretion where the facts uh, do not support the decision made by the trial court. And in general, uh, if the court can do a de novo review while accepting the findings by the trial court, then I don't think you have to send it back. But if there's an issue about the credit about the weighing, which uh, goes to this case here, which is my, part of my question here, is that when you look at the three pages that this that the trial court discussed judicial diversion here, you see no weighing of her findings against uh, weighing of the factors, including one of her findings, which is that she really wasn't buying Mr. Bradley's explanation for the violation of the order of protection. Uh, that seems to be the one credibility issue that I think. And, and that's here what in made me case. think of the question here yeah. was that. Well, I, I, there's. I think I've read two different statements. One is didn't really buy his explanation for the order of protection violation, and two seemed not or discounted her injuries. You know, because the testimony I think was. He told her she'd be fine, everything's okay, kind of discounted mm -hmm. her injuries, discounted the impact on her. I know, I know that's one of your issues is the impact on her, but he kind of discounted what happened to her and, and then also the order of protection. So she, that bothered her. She didn't, she, and she obviously didn't believe him on the order of protection. So if she said he's not being honest on the order of protection, mm -hmm. how can we weigh that any other way than against your client? Because she's made a credibility finding that he was being un untruthful and that he basically, she's saying, you knew you were violating it and didn't care. So that would go against your client. Well, I'm not sure the court said that. No, she didn't. But by saying, yeah. I don't oh, okay. believe oh, I, okay. your, I don't believe your explanation for the, for the, for violating the order of protection means you're lying to me about violating the, about the role you played in violating or what it meant. So I, She's, she said that that factor, that, that specific one, you're lying. And so how can we give him any credit on the order of protection issue if, I if may, she said he was lying about it? Okay, if I may interject and just... Uh, you, you can have all the time you want. No, <laughs> I have 12 minutes, but humbly I want to say she never said he was lying, and she never said you perjured yourself in court. What she said, because, and I'm, I'm going to get to why, this, this, is, this is a soft 
non-acceptance of a witness's testimony by the trial court. And, I, and I'm going to explain why. It, the, what the court actually said is this court is also concerned that I'm having difficult time. I was having a difficult time of accepting Mr. Bradley's explanation for violating the order of protection. Look at the record here. On the record, the only person who talked about the violation of the order of protection was Mr. Bradley. And he explained, I got this order of protection. It's an order of protection coming out of Indiana. He's living in Kentucky. He receives it from the sheriff's department, and he does nothing. And then, he, according to his testimony, he receives phone calls from Ms. Witt, and he accepts those and gets a violation of order of protection. And that's when he hires a lawyer. Now, the court is not saying, you're lying. She's saying, I'm having a difficult time accepting that. And part of it I can understand, because the court, from her own experience, was asking some questions herself about the order of protection. She said, well, when you got the order of protection, didn't you go to court? And he said, at first he says, yes, but actually, no, I didn't until later. Uh, didn't, didn't the judge explain to you about the order of protection? No contact? He says, I never went to court. And so I can understand the court's difficulty accepting some of it from her experience of probably knowledge about, but there's nothing in here where anybody, no, they never call a w Ms. Witt back, they never call anybody back to say, he's not telling the truth. He gives his explanation, and she just says, probably from her own experience, uh, it, that, that I'm just having difficulty accepting it. She doesn't go any further than that, though. And so, then the so other I thing- I know I said I was gonna be quiet, but that, that actually doesn't help me any, because she's, she knows what she means by that. I could tell you, <laughs> and I, I'm having trouble accepting your argument. I could mean, hey, I just don't get it. I could mean, I think you're lying. I could, I could mean lots of different things by that statement. So I don't know what she means by it, so maybe I should send it back so she can explain what she means. And while, while I've obviously <laughs> asked the court to go ahead and do a de novo review because I feel that the presumption of, reason, the presumption of reasonableness and the abuse of discretion doesn't apply here because of numerous things that we've pointed out in our brief, that's part of the problem. We don't know what the court's meaning here, um, other than I'm having difficulty accepting it. We also don't know what the court means when she f repeatedly says, so I don't think that this factor weighs against him when talking about amenability of, of correction, or amenability for correction. And the fact he has no criminal record, I don't think this factor weighs against him. And then, you know, the state argues that, well, we can implicitly or infer that that means it's favorable for him. And I'm going to follow that up for just a second. But we can't tell that for sure. I don't know what it means when, I, when they say, I don't know that that factor weighs against him. When obviously it looks like it should weigh in his favor. Amenability of correction, there's a lot of things in here that the court, that were presented to the court, uh, that show that he is amenable to, uh, amenable to correction. There's also things in here, the, the fact he has no criminal record should be obvious that it's in his favor. But I don't know what the court's meaning by that. And then she goes, and I'll contrast that. The court does know how to say when something's favorable for him because in the very next sentence, the court was presented in his packet a number of letters in support of Mr. B. Bradley, which I think weighs favorably for him as it relates to his social history. So she knows how to say when it's favorable to him. Now, here's the thing, Your Honor, or Your Honors. Um, what, what is really missing in here is the requirements under the Supreme Court case of King, Electroplating, and Parker, and that is weighing these factors. First, I don't know, first, the record is absent, clear, explicit understanding of what the court meant when the court was addressing some of the electroplating factors. But then it's completely absent of any weighing of those factors in this. The court, do, I will concede, the court does cite the case of Par State versus Parker, which is the electroplating factors, also seen in King, uh, the Supreme Court case of King, and the court goes through some of them, but the record's not clear of what the court means by these things. And then the court says, but the two factors, the two factors that I'm most concerned about are circumstances of the offense and the uh, deterrence. And, and when you look at this, there, there's, there's three pages dealing with the court's decision on judicial diversion. Learned counsel spent nearly 10 pages weighing the factors. <laughs> I spent nearly 28 pages challenging uh, the court's decision. Um, I, I encourage this court to just look at page, uh, volume three, pages 90 through 93, 
uh, to see if really this complies, if this is sufficient for the court to have an adequate review of the court's determination to deny judicial diversion in this case. Because you can see that the court goes exclusively to the considerations of circumstances of the offense and deterrence. And again, I, and the deterrence, the, the fact that there was, the facts that were relied upon for deterrence was this uh, con concern of accepting Mr. Bradley's explanation of the order of protection, which doesn't really tell us what it means. I mean, it's not explicit. And now the circumstances of the offense, that's where we also have another problem with the court's, um, uh, with, with the trial court's denial of judicial diversion here. Because the court goes on to say, but this court cannot overlook the lasting impact this conduct has had on Ms. Witt's life. Repeatedly, the court talks about that over the next two pages, that it occurred, the court goes on to say it occurred in 2000 and then corrects itself to say 2001, and in 2023, Ms. Witt is still experiencing this physical impact of Mr. Bradley's conduct. To this day, she's still experiencing the financial decline as a result of this, so this, too, has had a lasting impact on her. The problem with this is, as, as this court has said in Medea, 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 as in Wells recently in December of last year, that the sentencing court focused on an irrelevant factor, that is Ms. Witt's, the impact on Ms. Witt about, uh, uh, from, from the injuries that she suffered. And the courts have held that that is an irrelevant factor. But it's to the exclusivity of all the other factors. There was nothing else discussed about the circumstances of the offense. And that's why this fails and the presumption of reasonableness and, uh, and abuse of discretion uh, does not apply in this case. That alone takes it out of there and, and begins a de novo review. But aren't the, the effect on the victim, isn't that part of the circumstances of the offense? I mean, aren't they really closely related? Especially in this case, it seems. It, it would be for sentencing about determination of whether he should get two, three, or four years but it's not about for judicial diversion. Uh, this court has specifically held in Medea that the consideration of the victim's impact uh, or the impact on the victim of the offense is, is, not the, is an irrelevant consideration. It can be, if, the court had, if this trial court had taken that consideration and also joined it with some other considerations of the circumstances of the offense, then I probably would say to your honor, you're right. It's, explain, it's, what you, it's ex explain what you mean yes, by other circumstances of the offense. Well, for instance, the state talks in their brief about circumstances of the offense, and they try to say that this was an intentional act. Okay. When actually Mr. Bradley pled guilty to a negotiated settlement of aggravated assault by reckless conduct. If the court... It, if the trial court had gone to look at facts like, if, and, and one of my arguments about against the state's position on that is that this trial court did not look back at the underlying charge, the initial charge, as was in Kilgo that they cite in support of their position. In Kilgo, they specifically went back to the underlying charge and that trial court gleamed from the victim impact statement that it was, not it was, it was a statutory rape committed by force. And the court, of course, this court reversed that saying that that statement, that victim impact statement did not support that. But um, other circumstances, had the court gone back and said, well, you know, he was initially charged with aggravated assault and it looks to me, to this court, like it was intentional and you got a break on your, on your negotiated settlement, so I'm not going to give you judicial diversion. Or, say, in a sexual offense, if, if the court said, you know, I, I'm going to deny judicial diversion because I think it's important that this be on the record for other employers or whatever to be aware of it. So to be clear, then, your position is if the trial court had said, I found this intentional, whatever, you know, it was, he, he knew he was going to do this, he intentionally did it, he wanted to hurt her, whatever the trial court could find based on the record. I'm not saying that's true. Just, and also that she suffered extensively, then that would be okay. It, it would purge consideration of the irrelevant conduct because as, as the, this court said in Wells, where the court focused on the, that a death occurred, in a sense saying that because, of a, because there's a death, I'm not gonna give judicial diversion, this court wrote that we also concluded that the trial court statement at the sentencing hearing 
which did not engage in any additional review or analysis of the circumstances of the offense beyond the fact that a death occurred reflects that his denial of diversion was influenced by an improper factor. That is clearly here in this case. I mean, page 90, 92 and 93, that's the only thing that, uh, that the trial court ties into the circumstances of the offense. Um, Oh, deterrence. Uh, the, uh, the, the court did consider the factor of deterrence and uh, addressed it with, as, as, as Your Honor had pointed out, uh, the violation of the order of protection, which seems to have an explanation that the court wasn't completely buying, though not calling Mr. Bradley a liar or untruthful. Um, and, and frankly, there's nothing else in the record. So, I mean, the, you know, I could stand here and say there's nothing to support the court's position that he to not accept his explanation. And the state certainly could have called, Ms. Witt stood there and read her statement. She certainly could have called Ms. Witt to rebut his, his account of what happened uh, during the sentencing hearing. But, um, but the thing again about the deterrence is that one, it's very unclear as to what the court means by I don't really buy his explanation. And then number two, and number two, it never gets down to weighing that deterrence against the other factors. Here's where I was going to loop back again to the state's argument. If the state's saying that, well, factor one, two, and three are obviously in his favor because the court just said, well, I'm not going to hold that against him, then where's the weighing of those factors against uh, the circumstances of the offense and against deterrence? Where is that weighing analysis that the state does a really nice job? Because in its brief, it says, if the court's going to conduct a novel review, let's tell you why he shouldn't get diversion. And we got page after page after page of weighing it. We don't have that in here from the trial court. And for that reason, I would say that the, uh, I would ask this court to reverse the trial court sentencing decision, place Mr. Bradley on judicial diversion for a period of two years. The reason I say two years is that there was a lot of mitigation in this case. I think the court abused its discretion in the sentencing because there was a lot of mitigation in this case. It's loaded with it. His age, his lack of uh, the, the the lack of any likelihood of committing another crime, uh, his voluntarily going into rehab and everything. I know I'm eating into my, uh, uh, but this is very important. He voluntarily went in to get anger management, went in to get alcohol treatment. Remember, this thing started on July 4th, 2021, at a party downtown where both of them were drunk, um, and he goes and gets uh, gets into counseling and gets into alcohol assessment treatment. He has children that he's supporting. He has a very good job. One last thing I do want to point out. The court, the court did not consider the fact, a relevant factor. And this is, this is important. The court did not consider a relevant factor. And that relevant factor was the, did not discuss whether the ends of justice in the interest of the public could be served as well as those of the accused. And Mr. Bradley put on very, uh, put on proof that he will lose his security clearance and just lose his job as general manager at Warner Fertilizer because fertilizer has to be regulated by the Department of Homeland Security as a result of the Oklahoma bombing case. And he's a vice president for the Kentucky Agricultural Association, soon to be president. And it will affect that, in, in the stigma of being a, a convicted felon will affect, he'll basically have to resign from that position because he meets with Kentucky legislators to advance agricultural issues or to lobby for agricultural purposes. That factor was never even considered, and it's a relevant one. So again, I, I, th I think that this uh, needs to be reviewed, and I ask this court to grant the relief that we requested. Thank you. May it please the court, Alan Groves on behalf of the state. I'd like to begin by addressing the appropriate standard of review. I know your honors hear a lot of judicial diversion cases. Um, the trial court's findings here were much more specific than a lot of cases I've seen in my time at the AG's office. The court specifically cited the Parker decision. It specifically went through each of these factors um, with the exception of, of the last one that the defense attorney just mentioned. 
um, which this court has held failure to identify one specific factor, including that one, is not reversible error or, or grounds for applying de novo review. And here the trial court did expressly state that it was um, the, the two factors driving its decision were the circumstances of the offense and the need for specific deterrence. Now, the defendant apparently would impose another requirement that the court um, state, I hereby declare that I am now weighing these two factors against the remaining factors. This court has never imposed such a requirement. It's, it's very clear when you, read the con when you read the whole transcript in context that those were the two factors that outweighed the remaining factors. The defendant is also trying to, again, require magic words with respect to the, the factors that the trial court said were, did not weigh against him. But again, when the court says that your lack of a criminal history does not weigh against you, it, it's pretty clear that that factor therefore weighs in your favor. And similarly, with respect to a defendant's physical or mental health, this court has held that the lack of evidence regarding that factor means that the trial court can weigh it either neutrally or favorably. So we, we really think there's, there's sufficient findings here to trigger the abuse of discretion standard of review. I do want to address this point that the trial court's reference to the effects of the offense on the victim was an irrelevant factor. The defendant in his reply brief says that we conceded that that is an irrelevant factor. We didn't concede anything. On page um, 21, we say, we acknowledge that this court has made that statement in previous unreported cases like the, the Medi decision. Um, but I, I would encourage the court to perhaps revisit that um, analysis and perhaps clarify that the effects of the offense on the victim um, is not only permissible, but it's actually required that trial courts consider that. So the, vi the Victim Impact Statement Act requires trial courts in sentencing to consider the victim impact statement. The statutory definition of a victim impact statement is that it means a statement providing information about the financial, emotional, and physical effects of the crime on the victim. And then it goes on to say, um, and the circumstances surrounding the crime and the manner in which it was perpetrated. So the trial court's actually required to consider the effects of the offense on the victim. And we don't agree that that is an irrelevant factor but nevertheless, we have pointed out that when you're reading this transcript, um, it's clear that the trial court kind of makes this an offhanded remark when it's responding to the defendant's concern that perhaps a felony conviction for him would have long-lasting impacts. The court's just observing that Miss Witte has also experienced long-term financial and physical and mental health impacts from the offense. And I think that's completely fair game. Um, it's not an irrelevant factor that would require de novo review. Judge Dyer, to your point, I certainly agree that if a trial court makes a credibility determination that this court is bound by the credibility determination, at least with respect to the factor that that credibility determination relates to. So here, the, the lack of candor, which would go towards both the need for specific deterrence and amenability to correction. Now, if the defendant lied about what cereal he ate for breakfast, you know, this court, that might not prevent this court from conducting a de novo review. I think it is probably fact specific and case specific. But here, when. So, how do we, though, to, to counsel's point, the statement is, I'm having trouble with this. I don't know what that means. I mean, I have my assumptions, and am I supposed to say, based on the reading of the record, this is what we think the trial court meant by that? Or should we send it back and say, you need to explain it and do a better job? So that's what the trial court said when it was making its ruling at the end of the sentencing hearing. Um, but if you read earlier in the transcript, the, the court actually interjected when the defendant was testifying and started asking him, just sua sponte, like, are you saying that you were never served with the order of protection? Um, are you saying you didn't understand it? And that there was a dialogue there between the defendant and the trial court. So I think if you go back and look at that colloquy in the sentencing hearing, it's clear that the court was not buying his explanation that he didn't understand that he had violated the order of protection. Because um, he did admit that he that there was an order of protection. He claimed that the victim had called him. And then he initially said, I didn't even know what an order of protection meant. And I didn't understand I was violating it. He kind of waffled on whether he ever went to court um, 
and learn more about it from the judge. But he did admit that a sheriff's deputy had served him with the order. So I, I think it's it's pretty clear that the court made an implicit credibility determination that he was not being completely forthright about the overall circumstances there, which again does go directly to both the need for specific deterrence um, because it bears on his a minute on his likelihood to offend. And I also think, and as this court has held, um, lack of candor goes to amenability to correction, which even though the court said that it was not weighing against him, clearly does. And when this court's considering the overall decision to deny judicial diversion, it's looking for any substantial evidence to support the court's determination. So I think even though the trial court did not, ex did not purport to rely on the amenability to correction, this court can nevertheless consider its factual findings that would be relevant to that factor um, in affirming. And certainly if the court were to conduct de novo review, that factor would come into play as well. Turning to the merits, um, again, the court's only looking for any substantial evidence, more than a scintilla of evidence to support the trial court's ruling. With regarding to the circumstances of the offense, the court has repeatedly held that leniency in plea negotiations does bear on the circumstances of the conviction offense. Here, the defendant was charged with aggravated assault by intentionally or reckless or knowingly causing serious bodily injury. He pled down to aggravated assault with reckless intent. And I understand this was a plea and that it, it only involved the reckless intent. But when you go back and look at the plea hearing, when the state is giving the factual basis for the plea to which the defendant agreed, it's pretty clear that this assault was intentional. He, the factual basis was that the defendant knew the victim was downtown with other individuals and he was upset about that. So when she returned, he pushed her to the ground and broke her hip. But did the trial court talk about that or use that in the weighing at all? No, no, Your Honor. The court did not specifically go into that, that line of reasoning. But again, when this court's reviewing the court's decision under a, an abuse of discretion standard of review, we're just looking for any evidence in the record that would support the court's determination. So, so I agree that the court did not explicitly discuss that, but I think it would be fair for this court to consider the leniency in plea negotiations. And similarly, with respect to the false imprisonment charge that was dismissed, Ms. Witte's victim impact statement also provides evidence that the defendant um, kept her confined in the hotel room when she had tried to leave after this event took place. And again, at sentencing, the court would only be required to find by preponderance of the evidence that the facts as originally charged could have been proven by the state. So I think this court could also consider that um, in an, analyzing the circumstances of the offense. I've already addressed, Judge, your question about the effects of the offense on the victim. I think that's also appropriate. And I, I agree that's where, where the court focused its concern on this factor. But the other factor that was really driving the court's decision was the lack of remorse, which it tied into the need for specific deterrence. And, and Judge Dyer, you had kind of alluded to this earlier. I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as a credibility determination, but it's certainly something that um, the trial court gathered from observing the defendant's demeanor and his tone at the hearing, which again, this court would give great deference to. But even on a cold record, I was able to discern just by reading the transcript that the defendant was certainly casting blame at the victim and other people. Um, he would repeatedly reference the fact that they were both drinking, that uh, Miss Witty had chosen not to bring her cell phone, which is why he didn't know where she was. He alleged that someone had spiked his drink um, although he didn't have any trouble remembering anything else um, that apparently happened that night. So there's all these instances where the defendant was um, suggesting that it was the, the victim's fault or that they were equally responsible for what happened. And the court clearly weighed that against the defendant when it considered the need for specific deterrence, which was appropriate. The victim also explained that there were other instances such as um, one instance that happened in November 2021 at her apartment complex after this event where he had kind of gotten aggressive and prevented her from um, either entering or leaving a fitness area um, at, the, at the apartment complex. And she eventually ended the relationship because she said there was an escalating pattern of abuse. 
So there's certainly more than a scintilla of evidence to support the trial court's findings in this case. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the length of the sentence um, that was a within range sentence for this offense, but if your honors have no further questions, we'll rest on our briefs for that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, this one. Most of the last few minutes that the state addressed to the court about the facts that were brought during the sentencing hearing would be nice if the trial court had weighed those. But when you look at pages 90 through 93, the trial court does not address those at all, does not address remorse, does not address uh, the victim impact statement, does not address many of the things that the court has, th that the state has asked this court to consider to support the state's position. And I'm gonna tell you, when someone says that the, when the, the state is wrong, when they say that there is not a requirement to weigh the factors, this court in Kilgo specifically said that if the court, the trial court, has based its determination on, on only some of the factors, it must explain why these factors outweigh the others. And it cites to Park the very cornerstone of judicial diversion, State versus Parker. It is a requirement that the court put on the record so that this court can have an adequate record to review the weighing of the factors. What I'm saying here is that we got some ambiguous language and we got some specific language with some ambigu ambiguity, amb ambiguity in it. And never does the trial court weigh those particular factors. And that, the trial court did focus its attention on the impact or the effect that, this effect that these injuries had on the victim over the t three years after the incident occurred. But this court cannot overlook the lasting impact that this conduct has had on Ms. Witt's life. And I'll rest on that, please, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you. All right. uh, we're going to take uh, just five minutes and we'll be right back to recess. <laughs>